And we are back for yet another week of Behind the Lens. Welcome to old listeners and new alike. And I know every week we have more new listeners out there, and I thank you for that. And as a reminder, if you miss us live, you can catch us as a podcast on iTunes starting every Tuesday after the Monday show. Uh, the audio is also available on MovieSharkDeBlore.com as well as on Adrenaline Radio dot com in the archives so you can find us even if you miss us live and then we also shoot with multi-camera do a full edit and those videos are generally up on youtube by wednesday night or thursday morning depending on who's editing um so you can find us everywhere but i love having you join us uh every monday live because live is where it's at i'm debbie lynn elias film critic to a whole bunch of outlets and a whole bunch of places all around the world in print and online. And as I said, every Monday you can find me here at Adrenaline Radio with Behind the Lens. Today is a fun, fun show. Today is, as we all think we always are, always worthy. And my guests today are going to, uh, are definitely more than worthy as we welcome at the first, at the quarter hour mark we're going to have Amberly Coulson. Amberly has written it, it's a true script to a degree everything you see in there you just envision that you know actors and people in the industry and even out of the industry that uh, get in their own way and prevent success from happening to them and that is uh what we see with the character of Jules Jensen which Amberly created and Amberly stars in the film Joining Amberly uh, at the half hour mark today are going to be two incredible actors. One, Eric Edelstein. Uh, he was in this little film last year, Jurassic World. And then, of course, one of my all time favorite celebrity name game con celebrity contestants, Ian Gomez is also going to be with us. He's going to be uh, calling in at the half hour mark along with Eric. So we're going to have the boys together, uh, but we'll start at 1115 or so with Amber Lee when she calls in. Uh, and then if she wants to hang around while the boys are on the phone, that's fine too. But it's more fun to talk about them when they're not, when they're not here. So a lot of big, big, big doings coming up in film. Uh, I'll give you a little sneak peek now. Saw Captain America. Civil War this weekend. Um, I got booed at the global press conference yesterday for the statement that I made. That for my money, Captain America Civil War is better than Star Wars The Force Awakens. From a story standpoint, character development. I see Brian pulling the mic down. I'm going to hear something coming. Oh, no. I was just going to transition <laughs> because you mentioned Star Wars. Oh, well, go ahead. Uh, funny you should mention Star Wars because we are following... What the, the countdown? The countdown to episode eight. We have six hundred and twelve days, twelve hours, fifty six minutes, and ten seconds to go. But the good news is, we have two hundred and forty eight days to go until Rogue One comes out. Uh huh. And did you hear the latest news? I have not. It is rumored that Frank Oz has headed across the pond to the studios. Wow. Which could that mean? An appearance by Yoda? Well, I mean, it would, would it make sense in the Rogue One? It would, right? In the Rogue One timeline? Yoda can be anywhere. Yoda can be anywhere. Yeah, because he's still... I mean, I don't want to spoil the movie. For anyone who hasn't seen episode four through through uh, six, but Yoda's still around. Yeah. In this time period, because it's right in between... It's right before episode four. So, yeah, I mean, I, that would be awesome to see a, a Yoda. And we could see him in episode eight as well. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's actually been talked about. Yeah. So I love rumors. That, that I just I just heard yesterday. So we'll see how that pans out. But that would be so very lovely to have Yoda pop up. But That's your Star Wars countdown. That's my Well, thank you for that Star Wars countdown. But as I was saying, Captain America, and you'll, you'll hear more about that. The film comes out on May 6th. So we'll be talking about that as we get closer to the release date, especially since reviews are embargoed uh, for a few more days. Uh, but yes, I was, I was booed by members of the press when I said that. But trust me, when, once you get to see this film, I think you're going to heartily agree. Of course, Paul Rudd did stand up and cheer for me and agree. 
So at least I had one vote of confidence. Um, so get that out of the way. <laughs> there is, and of course, don't forget Jungle Book opens this Friday. And as I have been saying for the past month since I saw it, it is, it is the bare necessity of cinema for the year. It is a must-see what John Favreau has done technically. Uh, the technology has advanced so much. I don't. It's to the point now. The actors are going to be eliminated soon. The technology has gotten so photorealistic, and that presents a whole ethical and employment issue that uh, something's going to have to play out in the world with that. I yes. hate to butt in once again. I know. Uh, yes. Um, uh, but I saw an extended trailer of it at Disneyland. Yes. And I agree with you with the with the with the way technology has 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 increased or even just where we're at now in movie telling because uh, i mean these animals just look hyper realistic and it's not just the animals it's the jungle it's the flora the font it's everything 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 is incredible about what i saw a little scene of it where um which scene did you see i saw i, I mean i've never seen the original so i don't know characters names but it's the one where the bear's trying to get uh the little kid to go get him honey. Oh, Baloo wants Mo he's trying to blackmail Mowgli into helping him get honey to, he, yeah, to stash for the winter. Of course, bears in the jungle don't, don't hibernate. hibernate. Yeah. Yes. That was that's the scene that they were showing. And um I, I thought it was I mean I, I from that scene alone I was like, I'm in. I mean if yeah. it's this witty and this entertaining with Bill Murray voicing the bear I'm in. And it it really is. And kudos to Favreau. Uh, and the screenwriters of The Jungle Book because it isn't, for those of you that know the 1967 animated version and all the cool songs, a lot of the fun songs are are in the film, in this lo in this photorealistic live action uh, blend, and it's fabulous. But it, instead of just duplicating the animated version, they have expanded on the storylines, pulling things from Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book stories because there's so much more that wasn't even in the animated film. Uh, anybody who reads out there, and I hope all of you do, um, get a copy of, of Kipling's The Jungle Book stories and uh, take a gander through it, and you may pick up some little things when you go see Jungle Book in the theater. So, you know, right now, there's some... Every, everybody knows there's great TV uh coming out of BBC, always has been. And, you know, thanks to outlet companies like, you know, Public Broadcasting, KCET, a lot of those, pro a lot of that programming does finally make its way across uh, the pond to the United States. Uh, there's a whole influx of programs that KCET now has in Southern California. Now, for all of you people in the British Isles, you already know about this show that I'm going to mention right now because it's now in the third season over there. United Southern California and other areas in the United States are just now getting the show here from the very first pilot episode. And so we're going to be a few couple years behind you. But the this, this show is called Shetland and it stars Doug Henschel. Doug is an amazing actor. You have seen him in police procedurals. You have seen him in so many films over the years. Uh, most recently on the big screen, uh, with Mads Mikkelsen in The Salvation, an incredible film, um, Wild West, uh, and also with Ava Green. If you haven't seen that, it is available on uh, Netflix and a few other of the digital streaming. It's also out on uh, DVD and Blu-ray. But Doug is the lead actor in this show, Shetland. And what is so fabulous about Shetland, it is shot on the Shetland Isles which is um, an archipelago of more than 100 islands to the northernmost of Scotland. No matter where you stand in Shetland, you're surrounded by ocean. You have a 360-degree view. And it's based on books by these wonderful murder mysteries by Anne Cleves. Uh, it's a series. She has multiple series of books out. Um, this, this particular series is the Shetland series with lead detective Jimmy Perez, who Doug Henschel plays. Um, it's kind of like, as I told Doug in our, during our exclusive interview, I said, it's kind of has a very much feel of Angela Lansbury in Cabot Cove, Maine, in the United States, this close knit community, but with darker themes to it. And 
he was in agreement. And this is what he had to say about Shetland and his character of Jimmy Perez. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. You know, when you're somewhere, you know, I think, you know, there's a line that Jimmy says to um, uh, his, one of his colleagues at the beginning, he says, you know, there's, there's, it's just us, you know, there's no cavalry coming over the horizon. Um, you know, I think, you know, that, A, it makes it, you know, it ramps up the seriousness of the situation that they're in, and it also makes people an awful lot closer because they have to work together, you know, that much closer. And also when, you know, it's difficult to get a phone signal anywhere, then, you know, again, it makes you kind of improvise a little bit. But, um, no, I'm, I'm glad you like it, and I, and I like your description. That's, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, and your performance as Jimmy Perez, you know, he's, he's, you're trying to find a balance and you're bringing in a new character, midpoint in his life, but starting out again in so many ways. How do you throw yourself into that moment? Um, I, I think that the, the thing is, is that um, one of the things that made me want to do it was because I thought he was basically... Um, a, 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 a nice man who didn't, I mean, you know, most, a lot, an awful lot of detectives that you see on TV series, they're either, you know, they're alcoholic, they have gambling problems, you know, there's some big crutch that they're hiding. And basically the, the thing that was with this guy was he was trying to bring his daughter up the best way that he could, having lost, you know, their mother. And I think, you know, like, that appealed to me because it was much more of a kind of recognizable um, heart that somebody had, and I thought he's just a good man trying to do, trying to do the best he can. But it's a, but it's more recognisable as being something quite normal that's wrong with him. Do you know what I mean? He misses his wife, and and he's struggling to bring up his his daughter with who isn't his biological daughter. You know, and and I I I really like that. Um, and you know, I suppose you know, being a middle aged man, I don't have any kids, but you know, like you know, I've been surrounded by my sister's kids for my whole life and watched them grow up. So I, I, I felt like some of that was, was, was familiar to me and familiar enough to me for, for me to be able to drop into it quite comfortably. Um, and then the rest of it came around, you know, purely. I, I, David Kane, who wrote the pilot, I'd, I'd worked with him, you know, a number of times over the years. And we both come from the same city in Glasgow. We know each other very well. And I love the way he writes for both men and women. He's one of the very few men who write well for women. He writes recognizable women. Mm -hmm. He writes men who like women. Um, and I like that about the writing that's there, and I think that comes over very clearly is that you're dealing with a man who actually enjoys the company of women, not in any predatory way, but and he, he likes being around them, he likes talking to them, he knows how to relate to them, and, 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 and I liked all that stuff. And that's, that is another standout aspect of the series, is that, you know, Doug's counterpart, uh, is played by Alison O'Donnell and a police inspector herself uh, called Tosh McIntosh, uh, Alison McIntosh, but everybody calls her Tosh. And as I learned from Doug, this is the first big role she'd ever had. She was basically learning how to do TV, playing out is a co-starring role in every episode of a BBC One production. And she brings this raw honesty, this great truth to the role. I mean, any woman, you know, she goes to a crime scene. The first time we meet her, really, she's at the crime scene and there's a corpse there and she vomits all over the ground. And in character as Perez, he says, yeah, you'll get used to it. She goes, no, it was the Dutch chocolate vodka I drank last night. So, I mean, it's just deadpan. It's refreshing. And it's really interesting. The stories are interesting. As I said, uh, the first two years are based on various Cleves books. Season three, which uh, Britain is now getting to see, is a brand new standalone that David Kane has written. Uh, and it's actually a mini series as opposed to one hour episodics. So I can't wait to see those. But in the meantime, everyone in Southern California and in other parts of the United States, check your public broadcasting stations um, because. The show has now come to the United States. It is so worth seeing. And here in Los Angeles, uh, I know that there is part of the Who Done It Sundays. And this month is actually 
Brit Week falls in this month, so there's going to be a lot of fun stuff that's going to be happening. So, again, I can't recommend it highly enough. Shetland on KCT Sunday night uh, with an encore at 9 p.m. with an encore performance Mondays at Monday night at 12:30 a.m. So, that is my television endorsement for the week. And of course, if you get a chance, pick up a copy of Salvation, watch it online because it is a fabulous film. Uh, it's a beautiful film, and it'll show you another side of Doug Henschel. And I see Brian playing with the telephone, which means that maybe he's playing with the phone, and I'm trying to get trying to get an answer. Oh, it is good. Is this the brilliant Amberly Coulson? <laughs> I love that introduction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome, Amber Lee Coulson to Behind the Lens. I am so thrilled to talk to you today. Well, likewise. This, your film, Always Worthy, is just, it is spot on. And as I said at the top of the show, it's not, while you pick up on so many things that so many actors are, that are signature stereotypes in the industry and touchstones, so much of your character of Jules Jensen, we all do that. We all get in our own way most of the time. And we really create more problems for ourselves to keep us from, you know, achieving our, our ultimate goal. Oh, yes. And, but I love your ultimate goal with this. You didn't even think that this would start because you wrote this, but it started as a, a one-woman stage show, Big Hair. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, I had dreams of it being a movie, but I just, <laughs> I felt like I only knew how to do stage as an actress. I was like, well, the film world was so big and massive, and um, I was working with a wonderful man named Steven Anderson at the time, and he was, he really helped flesh out this character, Jules Jensen, and we're like, let's put her on stage for 90 minutes. And in hindsight, it was the best gift, I mean, especially as an actress, I could have given myself because it was instant feedback. You know, the jokes either work or don't work. People either resonate with the character or they don't. So the run of that uh, play, Big Hair, just gave me everything I needed to then go in and adapt it for the screen. And, of course, when people watch the film or even if they just look at the poster with the huge oversized <laughs> you know 1960s vel you know velcro rollers um i'm wearing them right now i am sure you are i have no doubt <laughs> i mean i do wear them every i mean you gotta you gotta do you gotta do for the volume well that's just it to get that kind of fluff and volume that, <laughs> that is if my mother were alive she would be praising you right now the woman that went and had her hair styled and set on rollers every week at the beauty salon from the time she was 17 years old until the day she died so it's all about volume and style it's all about volume so Jules Jensen is bringing it back. I'll tell bringing you back the hair pieces as well. But I have to say, you know, the hair, it's very lovely and bouncy in the film. <laughs> I, you know, that was, its, that was an old, that was its own character. I think it was, especially that the attached hair. Pony. Oh, especially the attached hair piece. I mean, you gotta love that. That's just instant volume right there. Now, wait a minute. Did you just say that was the Tony pony? Phony, po oh, phony pony. Oh, because you know there is there is the one woman who's Tony, and I can't think of her last name, who sells all those clip-on hair pieces like that and hawks them on home shopping. I feel like I need to know Tony. I feel like you She probably... does, like, on the QB, or what's that channel? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, she's, she, for years, she's been selling on HSN. Self-tanning, oh so self-tanning, clip-on hair stuff, in all different colors, too, mind you. <laughs> Obviously, we know what I have done in some of my spare time. I, <laughs> well, I feel very, I feel like me and Jules has a kinship <laughs> with you. So it, how, do you, how would you describe the character of Jules Jensen and, how, and the story of the movie, which I'm guessing you've expanded from the stage play because now you have a lot more, you've got more characters here. Yes. Um, well, you know what's great? You know, Nancy Morgan plays 
uh, Jules's mom in the film, and she actually was the voice. Big Hair was a stage production, but it was uh, a one-woman show, and then, but it was still Jules. The audience got to talk with Jules, similar how Jules breaks the fourth, fourth wall in the film. And um, but you got to learn about our world through voice messages and different ways we played with audio mm -hmm. as far as the stage was concerned. So some of the characters that we that Jules knows were in the original format, but um, definitely fleshed out. And I would say, I mean, I hope it's definitely, and I'm glad you thought it was universal. I definitely think even though it's so specific to an actress's struggles, it's really the universal struggle to stay true to yourself and just uh, kind of the hopeful message that you can figure out what's important to you and then follow through with that, which I think is Jules' key to kind of finding her own peace and happiness. And it's also uh, a really poignant mother-daughter story and just the struggle of that complicated relationship and how it affects Jules and all the struggles she goes through to kind of accept herself, but her mom is sort of this mirror for her. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, it's so beautifully, you know, with Nancy Morgan actually on screen playing your mom in the film. And I adore Nancy. And of course, her son, Jason Ritter. Jason! Jason! Oh, Yay, hilarious. Jason! How funny is he? He's... When he hangs his head, you know, as a casting agent, and then Jules is just improvising rather than reading the lines as they should be read. <laughs> and when Jason hangs his head in just utter desperation and frustration and then realizes that she's been faking a pregnancy and walk gets up and walk, it's just... And knowing Jason... I mean, it was just so rich to see him in this little role. He can take the smallest roles and oh. turn them into the best things. And you know, I 100% agree. And he's just such a comedic genius in that way. And he really knows he was so good at, because, you know, the script only does so much. And he was so good at his reactions are priceless, as you said. And it, it really helps, especially when you know comedy and you watch a lot of comedy. Like, he gave the audience everything they needed to to like make jewels to make those jokes hit i mean it's very technical now that we're talking but i just think really good comedians know that and they don't even know they're doing it they just react so brilliantly i mean i told i've told jason in the past um because i've talked to him many times and i've told him in the past i said you know you definitely got your father's dna oh for sure I mean, yeah, you know, just talking to him, whether on screen or off, he's just hilarious. He's just, and he's both Nancy and Jason. And, you know, I don't know if you knew this, Carly Ritter, um, Nancy's daughter, plays our plays. She sings the final song in the film. Yes, I know. It's a whole, it's a whole family affair it's there. It's a whole family affair. We're so lucky that they're so talented and, um, and just amazing people, the most genuine and giving people. So... I felt so lucky to have all of them well, this be supportive of the story and, this and whole, be on the This film. whole film is a family affair, Amberly, because, you know, Mariana Polka is directing it, and you've known her forever, and you've worked with her before. Um, you worked with Ian in Love Shack before. You and Eric Edelstein, you go, the two of you go back to... Um, what, Good uh, Dick, Good which Dick. I was in the deleted scenes. Deleted scenes but that's okay. Dick. You were still working. Um, yes, of. it's totally a family affair. And, you know, Mitch Yapko and Sarah Lynn Critchlow, who produced the film, they're, this film would not be where it is without them. They worked on Good Dick with Mariana. So, and Mariana Polka is just her own creative. I mean, she's an actress, writer, producer, director. She does it all brilliantly, effortlessly. It's so inspiring. And really watching her, I was writing the show, the one-woman show, while she was doing good dick mm -hmm. and she was the first person of my inner circle that I saw who wrote something and said okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna go film it and direct it and produce it and she was a, such a mentor to, to and you just need that role model um to know oh my god that could be possible mm -hmm. and so her film her first film good dick was a huge inspiration for me in thinking that I could even pull something off you know now how challenging was it for you in adapting 
a stage perform your own performance because obviously on camera you're going to perform differently than you perform when you're on stage to a live audience. Oh yeah, how such, was, yeah, such a different medium. That's so true. How was that for you in the adaptation and translation from an acting standpoint, and also to elim- to get it out of your head, you know, your writer's hat and your actress hat. Yeah. Well, you know, that, I love this question because I, I, when Sarah Lynn and Mitch, who produced the film, I told them right off the bat because um, I really wanted to be heavily into the producing world. And, mm-hmm. But when we filmed, we all had really, we were so supportive that they really took the reins so I could just try to keep the actor hat on. I mean, of course, you have to deal with things. And as you may or may not know with independent filmmaking, you know, it's, you never know what's going to happen that day or what fires you're going to have to put out. But, um, so I just tried to be really prepared. So in, in writing, to go back to just writing it from stage to screen, mm-hmm. it took a lot of drafts to just kind of hear all the other voices and, and stay true to the Jules's arc and her story and her struggles and the heart of it. But, um, and I know no one has reference of the one one show, but, uh, it was a lot harder than I thought. I was like, oh, I did the hard part. And then actually fleshing <laughs> out that world was <laughs> very humbling. I was like, oh, okay. Um, so that, but, it, you know, it was fun. It was, it was, um, it was, uh, it was a lot of work, but it was really fun. And then when, once I brought Mariana on board and she brought so much of her background, of just, she knows cinema so well and she's such a visionary. She really helped bring this heart of jewels to the screen and create all these visuals that really helped us tell the story um, in a cinematic way that you can't do on the stage, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, yeah, and I think that, like what you said about wearing all the hats, um, I mean, definitely being with Mariana and Mitch and Sterling, who are all doing their own work and working really hard, and so you don't have to pick up anyone else's slack, for sure. But... um, I think doing, like I said, in hindsight, doing that 90-minute run and kind of living as an actress, living that life, her arc, really helps when you shoot, obviously, out of sequence. You know, mm-hmm. it helps. It helped me, even though it had been, obviously, a couple of years, um, really feel, I just knew Jules inside and out. I understood it um, from having lived it and performed it. And um, and I just and I just knew I had memorized the entire script before <laughs> because I couldn't be... I just knew I needed to know the words like they were nothing. And um, that helps when you have an independent filming. We had 15 days to shoot. So you get a couple takes, and then you have to move on, whether you like it or not. So a lot of it was just, I think, in being freaked out and over-preparing <laughs> to not know what was going to happen when we actually had the cameras rolling. Now, because you were, you were also, you know, you were so heavily involved in the production of it and the producing also, you know, finding your way there were you involved in the look of the film because I have to say the look of the film the cinematography the production design keeping the light the light is very light you know Jules is always you know everything around her it's light there are windows it's airy you know pastel lighter shades of color and it all just fits with with the dreamer that Jules is yes yeah, you know, um, that's where, and Mariana is so visual. Her, She's such a genius in that way. And so when I brought her the script, we spent a long time. We made a lookbook and and just figuring out so that we both were communicating in this world mm-hmm. of vision now. And I I told her a lot about my heart of Jules is that she sort of has to be layered. And you, she's like peeling away an onion to get to her, like, true self and her heart. And um, and. And then Mariana brought in all these wonderful elements, like what you're talking about with light. And we, we talked a lot about um, when she's in her dreaming world, especially the f- first chunk of the movie, she is caught up in her dreams and her aspirations. And um, and also her mother services a lot of, like, nature. There's a lot of, like, green in the film and trees and the mm-hmm. tree in her apartment. And that's kind of her going back to her roots. And all of that discussion was um, was definitely handled before, and we worked with a really great DP, Vanessa Manulas, who um, Mariana and her worked together in a previous film. There's that family affair thing. They worked mm-hmm. together as well earlier. So there was a great shorthand that existed that I think really helps when you're short on time in general with independent filmmaking. So 
um, her and Mariana had a really strong relationship. And I think going into the film, they had we had already laid so much of what we wanted the film to be like that um, visually it all, then it was just a matter of getting it on camera. Mm-hmm. Well, now, you have to make a choice here. The boys are both on the other lines. Do you want to stay on the line? You want to stay on with them? I do. Oh okay. I'm going to let them talk a lot, but I love them to pieces. Okay. Brian's going to connect all the lines. Everybody's here now. Ian, are you there? I'm, I'm here, but I don't know if you can hear me very well. <laughs> I hear you I fine. Can, I can't hear you very well. Uh-oh. Let me try something else. Hold on. Hello? Hello? Oh, oh that's equally horrible. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> And yes, that giggling you hear is is your screenwriter and co-star. Who's that? I don't remember her name. D- Kimberly. <laughs> Hello. And Eric's uh, in there no. somewhere too. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. You know, let uh, me. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna try an, another tactic here. <laughs> um, all right. I love technology. I really do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you and me both, Ian. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, hold on one second. This is exciting. This is more exciting. This, amongst is, yourself this is pins and needles. Oh, this is, this right is actually as exciting as watching Ian on Celebrity Name Game. Oh. Have you... Are you, you, s- you something? I, I, you're one of my favorite celebrity contestants on on the show. Really? I love Ian. Nice I, oh, that's much better. I can hear you now. Oh, good. Now, can everybody, oh, Eric, can we hear you? Can you hear us? Yes, friend. Oh, this is so lovely. I am so thrilled to have you guys on here. This is such a fun film. It's quirky. It's fun. And you guys, Ian, you know, you put a twist in there with that character and emotion that I didn't see coming. And, Eric, you're just an absolute joy. And <laughs> And the fact that you you would you would humble yourself after playing a paddock paddock handler in Jurassic World, that you would <laughs> that you would grace always worthy with your presence. That's just no, a- oh, are you kidding? I'm lucky <laughs> that they would have me, and I'm just thrilled I didn't die in it because I'm, I die in every movie now, and my mom is so tired of it. Uh oh. Well, I'm afraid. Well, wait until the sequel, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Really? Did I die? Yeah, I'm sorry. I got some bad news for you. Well, I'm no, a, I and, well, I'm glad at least I could hear it from you. But I guess I'm no longer worthy. This hurts, but we <laughs> fight on. Well, you know, I you know, I'm afraid to ask now because when I leave the studio today, I'm going to go screen Green Room, which you're <laughs> in. <laughs> uh, you don't want to know, friend. You don't want to know. I think they show it in the trailer, though. It, they kind of show it in the trailer, so it's not a huge spoiler. But, yeah, it doesn't end great for me there either. Oh, my God. Well, it, it, <laughs> it sure ends great for you here. Amberly wrote a great part for you, and you just play it beautifully, even though you do have to wear a hot dog costume. Amberly, why did you do that to him? I mean, why not, right? It's so funny. Uh, we loved it. The hot dog costume was slenderizing, and we were shooting that gorilla style on the street. And there was a guy that was really selling hot dogs that threatened to call the cops on us because he thought we were taking away his business. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you know, now, now, Ian, how did you how did you get mixed up in in this hilarity? I mean, here um, here you are, a well, respectable actor. <laughs> well, you know, well, thank you. I, you know, I uh, as an actor in Los Angeles, um, whenever you get a phone call saying, "Hey, we have an offer." And I go, okay, stop there. I'll take it. <laughs> so um, you do. I said, I said yes. I said yes. And then I said, okay, let me let me read this first, just in case I have to be naked. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, I don't have to be naked. That's fantastic. It's good for me and everyone else involved. So um, and then the surprise was meeting everyone. And um, you know, Amberly is is a wonderful woman. And so kind and gentle and, and nurturing. And everyone on the set followed suit. It was, it was one of the best experiences, if not the best experience that I've, I've ever had as an actor, where it was just like, okay, let, you know, someone's fool, fooling me here. Someone's, someone's an a-hole here. 
I'm not sure who it is. And then I was like, no one. Then I go, okay, it must be me. I must be the terrible person here. <laughs> but everyone else is fantastic. And it was just like, a, a, it was a love fest. And like, everyone was just so upbeat all the time that I thought I was joining a cult. I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to, to think. Oh and, you know, I was, I was thinking the other, um, as, you know, I was getting ready for this, I was going back on, on the script in the movie, and there's not one wasted character. There's, like, yeah. everyone has, you know, they, they each have an arc. They all have, you know, something going on that's special, and not just Amber Lee. It's not just Amber Lee writing, uh, this is, you know, a piece for me and everyone else will support me in this, and they won't have anything to do. Everyone has such a, you know, they, uh, they go through a range of emotions. Mm-hmm. They go, you know, they have you know, funny things to do. They have uh, dramatic things to do. And it was just, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure being a part of it. And, but it was weird because Eric said when I saw, I saw him once, and he was not having as good of an experience. He, was, he had a <laughs> completely opposite experience than I was. Eric, why didn't you tell them about that? Yes, no, I was. I, I turned to walk three times. I felt like I was being verbally abused. Um, my therapist yeah. and my my Reiki healer both think that I have PTSD from Amberly and Mariana's abuse. Oh my! Uh, yeah, it was horrible. It had, yeah, it, it, I'm sorry. I'm oh. sorry. No, thank you, man. You were there for me. You were my rock, and, and I'm grateful. Yeah. But you know that that's what comes from Ian's experience. I mean, you guys have to remember. Ian survived playing not just one, but two of Murphy Brown's secretaries. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, I was, yes, I was, uh, I, yeah, I was on it twice. I was secretary number 77, you, which is uh, you, one of my claim to fame. See? Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, that was, you know, Eric, you talk about, you know, dying in all of these films and getting killed off. Every secretary in Murphy Brown disappeared, but Ian was there twice. I was there twice. How many, was, yes. how many got to come back? That's a tiny club, right, Ian? That's, That's a very small club, and we're dying off slowly, actually, in real life. So <laughs> I think I'm next. Now, all of you have played, you know, the guys have, Amber Lee is still waiting for that Jurassic World, my big fat Greek wedding moment. I uh, can't wait to <laughs> die, yeah. But, you know, how do you guys find the balance here? You You are, you're in these huge blockbusters, and but you still you go between TV, little indie gems, like always worthy, yeah, you know, and you just keep going back and forth. Is there a method to your madness, or is it just, hey, I got a role for you, I'll take it? Uh, I'll go with B. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I'm just... go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not. Just... I'm not that... <laughs> Let's all talk at the same time. I'm not, at, I'm not at the stage in my career where, you know, I can pick and choose everything. Every once in a while, it's like, you know, there's something that I'm like, well, I'd rather not waste the time. But for the most part, I'm a working actor, and, you know, we, 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 get, we take what we can get. You know, you, I mean, I don't have to take everything, um, but it's like it's mostly I, get to, I have to audition and, and sweat my, my butt off for a role that I don't really want, but it's, it's going to, you know, it's going to pay the bills. Um, and when this, you know, you get to do these wonderful, uh, uh, pieces that, you know, they're, 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 um, they come from the heart. They're, uh, I forgot the, the term I'm looking for, but you know, it's, uh, it's not just about making money. It's, it's about creating something that's, you know, means something to, to some, to a lot of people. So, you know, being a part of that was, uh, is, is, was a pleasure. Well, and I know last, last year you were in, in the hilarious comedy, Larry Gay, Renegade Male Flight Attendant. Um, <laughs> Mike Feuerstein was on the show talking about that film. And, I mean, I just, it is, it is comic gold. It oh, is. yeah, well, thank, yeah. That was another, uh, hey, I got a part for you. I'm like, well, oh, what's it called? Oh, uh, <laughs> all right, well, I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> Um, it was, you know, uh, I, I happen to know, uh, Mark Fierstein, so it was, it was, it was, a, it was a buddy favor, but it, it was, uh, another good experience, but not as great as, as this one. Absolutely. So, now what? Nice answer, Ian. Nice follow through there, Ian. Is yeah, it you that? like that? You like that? Okay, yeah, good. I like that. I like that. This is ensuring him a role in your, in the next film you write. You know that, don't you? 
Oh, for sure. I'm no moron. That's, uh... <laughs> so, so now what about for you, Eric? Because you similarly, you bounce around, you know, even though you do die in things, you know. You didn't die in Alexander in the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, though. No, and that was one I love because it's like this, you know, because of my size, I'm always going to get uh, bad guy offers. And I love, and that was kind of part of my plan in the beginning of uh, other people don't want to do them. And when I showed up to Green Room, I was like, how in the world did I get this? And he kind of looked at me and laughed and said, nobody wanted to play a Nazi. And I'm like, oh, okay, that makes <laughs> sense. So when you get something <laughs> like this, like, I, I, I was always in, like, I saw Amber Lee's play of this. And mm-hmm. it was brilliant then. And to see her get it on paper, and it, I was so proud of her and so excited. And there are so many characters like this that you meet in L.A., and also, you'll kind of see people sell their souls and lose their path a little bit, like her character does in Worthy, where I could really relate. Well, I'm sure Ian's the same. You'll, you'll run into somebody at the grocery store you used to be cool with, and then they give you a quick nod and walk off. And I'm like, oh, let me get an IMDb and see what ABC Family show they're on, why they can't talk to me anymore. Mm-hmm. Because people <laughs> get involved, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. He's on this or he's on that. I'm like, all right, in two years, you know, he'll be back and he'll be normal. But it's really funny, especially when it's one of my guys from Big Guy Editions. So I, th- that part of the story really resonated, and it was just, you know, dripping with heart and so much fun. But also, I was so glad to come in and play Eric and just be me to counter playing, you know, so many killers and kidnappers and bad guys, because it really does it wears on my mom. My wife is like, hey, oh, are, are you killing people? I'm like, oh, no, this one, I'm a kidnapper. But that's, if you're, <laughs> you know, if you're, six, if you're six four, 290, and you're okay playing bad guys, and I enjoy it, and it's, it's, it's fun in its own weird way, but something like this is great, because I could, I mean, I'm really friends with Amber Lee, and we could just show up and have fun together and dance around in hot dog outfits. But that's so much better than, like, having to deal with, with method actors that won't talk to you at lunch because you're playing a bad guy. Like, something like this, it, it's like Ian said, it, 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 it really was, like, just a completely fun, creative atmosphere that was so much fun to do. Oh, and I, and you, you're you just an absolute joy in it, Eric. And I have to I have to tell you, Amber Lee, that as much as Jules Jensen was lusting after the car- Lucas Haas as Breck, and I got to say, he really did look mighty fine and have a bad boy edge to him in this movie. Uh, but yes. the, the chemistry be, that you have with Eric, it's like I'm sitting there and it's like, oh, why doesn't she go out with Eric? Why doesn't she want to go out with Eric? Because he's just so nice. Perfect casting is what that is. And Who doesn't yeah, totally with Eric? Play with. That was totally fun to play with of this guy that's totally frustrated, but it's also on him because he's probably never quite told her. So he's just in, in a weird gray area, but it was so fun to just be able to have it be that easy every day where I can play with Amberly all day, and it's so fun. Now, Eric, because you saw the, you saw the stage production. So how I do you, did. So what do you think of the adaptation of how the script was adapted and how Mariana then, you know, directed and lends this? Oh, uh, the, the, the stage version that Amber Lee wrote is, is so close to this, and it goes in and out, and, and it was so brilliant and inventive in its own way. And then when, you know, she and Mariana gets together, get together, it's like crossing the streams, and they just kind of figured out the perfect way to do it. And they kept the, the heart of it and the, the really funny quirkiness of that character in, in such a fun way, where mm-hmm. it, was, it was kind of crazy to see it come together. And I'd worked with Mariana on her first movie, Good Dick, so I knew Mariana just directs with love. The whole set is full of love, and you feel so supported. And, you know, we're all kind of insecure in our own ways. But Mariana just kind of radiates this grace, and so does, and so does Amber Lee. And so it's just going to be this fun experience. But, you know, you'll see a lot of adaptations that don't work. And when I read this one, it was like, oh, wow, they nailed it. This, this is so cool. And it's, it's also brave of Amber Lee to at times just play so kind of mean and Forgetting about her mom and forgetting about me, and I mean, you know, she, I, I think there's, there's she could play some bad guys too, which is so fun to do. Yeah, you know, the only part I'd love to see her as a Nazi. That would be great. That, 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 Nazi. That, Come on. Well, you Come know, on. Well, you know what's interesting, guys, is that while Jules Jensen kind of brushed Eric to the side, brushed her mother to the side, she did not brush Rick to the side. Rick never got brushed away. She kept showing up on your doorstep. 
C, Rick? That's con- Ian, that's constant. That's oh, that's... Oh, hello? Yes. No, see, you're the one that she didn't brush away. Yeah. Well, you know, yes, because I had, you know, uh, you know, I was the uh, I was the agent guy, you know, I was uh, her <laughs> ticket to uh, fame and fortune. Um, uh, but I tried to brush her away. You know, that's uh, that's the thing. I was brushing her away, and she was uh, she was coming back at me, and then uh, then it became a love fest at the end, mm-hmm. which was very sweet. <laughs> that that twist uh, was beautiful. It, re- it it my heart just you know stopped. In that one single moment, and we're not going to divulge it, but that final that final meeting was just so sweet, Ian. And the total shift and emotional arc that you brought to Rick, just absolutely wonderfully done. Well, that's very nice, and I'd like to take credit for it, but it was written that way and directed that way, so I really had no choice. Uh, was, you're doing it this way, this is what you're doing. So it was, uh, you know, it, it was written so clearly... And uh, directed uh, so well that, you know, that was the, the natural way to go with it. Um, but you're right. I am really, really good. Yeah, you are really, <laughs> really good. Yeah. You know, now, um, I'm what, what, I, well, <laughs> what I love about Rick, and I have to imagine, have each of you experienced an agent or had encounters like what, you know, Jules was forced to endure from Rick and what your agent was forced to endure by each of you? Someone want to take that? <laughs> I, I think I'm still trying to get a job in this business. I, no, I mean, I've had crazy people before, uh, usually managers. Uh, I haven't had the typical uh, Hollywood agent, um, you know, like, you know, someone from one of the big agencies who is just like a complete uh, nutso. But uh, my managers are like a, they're a, a kooky cast of characters. Um that I've had before. One guy I think was either on heroin or narcoleptic. I don't know what he was. But he, Are you kidding? We, no, he was like, he, we had a meeting and he was dozing off in the middle of talking. Like he just kept getting lower and lower. He's like, Ian, I really see this being a part for you. And, uh, and like, his eyes were getting really heavy and I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And he's uh, <laughs> and I thought either this guy is brilliant or he's horrible. And a week later, I discovered he was horrible. Um, so, you know, they're, they're all out there. You know, yeah, it, I mean, the, the characters is not, it doesn't come out of thin air. It's, uh, it's based in reality. So, absolutely. And, and what, about, what about for you, Eric? Have you encountered or have you subjected an agent or manager to some of the similar tactics as Jules subjected Rick to? Yeah, well, when I saw what Ian did, I just loved it because he could have just played it, the, the, the jerk agent, but then you see the layers to it, which are so much closer to reality. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I lucked out now because my you know my, my agents and managers are, are, are genuinely good people. I'm not saying that. But when you're out here, they're, they're the gatekeepers to your dream. And I remember... I moved here, and I had my first agent also wrestled with some substance stuff. Looking back now, I know. I didn't know at 24 from Spokane. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, you're praying that this will be the opportunity, and you don't know, and it's deep in the valley, and then it's an office, and then it's a closet in an office. And then she's like, yeah, she's like, what's your dream, sweetie? What is your dream? And I'm like, honestly, I, I... my goal in moving to LA was all I wanted. I wanted to be on Curb Your Enthusiasm. That that was my dream, and I told her that. And I'm like, my my dream would be to be on Curb Your Enthusiasm. At that point, it was fairly newish, so it wasn't outlandish. And she said, I, I went in the next day, and she's like, "Here's what I did. I sent them your reel, and I sent them a diaper, and I said, put this on because you're gonna shit when you meet her." <laughs>
with a reel of my second city class performance. Oh. But you learn. You learn. Oh, that's I, that has to go I with never, somebody's script. Uh, I never did and what what Amberly what uh, Jules Jensen does in there, but I did at my first agent, and I didn't know really uh, what was acceptable and what was not. But I would hang out at my agent's uh, office and talk to the secretary for hours at a time. And when they would like, one of them would come out, and go, "Hey, how you doing?" You know, just <laughs> making myself present, and uh, they they dropped me. They they got rid of me. Now, Ow. now, Amberly, how much of Jules antics are based on things you have done? Well, ah. um, I can't, you know, I've never gone as far as Jules in some of her um, choices in the room, but I definitely, I definitely <laughs> become a different person under certain circumstances. But they also have a weird effect on people. Like, I'll go into a casting room and they're like, you, you, you're not right for this part at all. And that's like the first thing they say to me. And I'm like, cool. And most people are fueled by that. But I just completely shut down. All the creative juices, like, die. Aww. Or I'll get weird comments like, oh, my God, you totally look like Melissa Essence's girlfriend. Or it's like, I'll get weird people that I don't even know. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. I just go, okay, I, let's get started. I just Actually, really you, you look weird. more like a blonde Marissa Tomei, actually. Oh, I Ooh, can see I that. Yeah. You, you definitely profile. I'm out. You definitely, you've got, you look like a blonde Marissa Tomei. And she has an Oscar. I think we all do. I think we all do. <laughs> yeah, do uh, yeah. well, Ian, it's yeah. so true. I get it's that so all the true. time. We know yeah. you do, Ian. <laughs> we know you do. I know. So now, That's... now, guys, what is, if you had, what is the greatest gift that acting gives to each of you? Because you've been hammering away, you know, Ian, Eric, for so long. Amberly, you're hammering your away, you're branching out, you're writing now, moving into producing. What is the greatest gift that this gives you, that propels you and keeps you going? Uh, I'll, I'll start. For, for me, it's, um, I, I mean, the, the tangible, the most tangible thing I have is, for one thing, I can't believe it worked out. And this is really the only skill I have. I went to school to be a play by play announcer and I wasn't awesome at that. And, and I pinch myself all the time. But when I think about, when you ask that, the first thing that jumped in my mind was I did, you do, do all these movies and their pictures on the wall, but I did one in Puerto Rico. And I found a dog on the beach, and I brought the dog back. My wife's a dog groomer, and so I have this Puerto Rican jungle dog named Chupi, and I, and I always look at her, and I'm like, oh, this came from acting. It's so funny, because you never know how any of these will turn out. It was a Jean-Claude Van Damme comedy, and the, mo the, you know, the movie was not acclaimed, but I look at it, and I'm like, that's yeah, so crazy. I got this dog from acting, and she's just my, my best little friend. So that always, to me, feels like this. I look at her, and I'm like, oh, you're on the right path. You, you, you got this dog from just work, and, and things kind of work out. And I, I always kind of pinch myself everything worked out, and I just feel super happy all the time. Aww. Most 80% of the time. Being and, unemployed all the time is also hard. But well, beyond that, it's okay. <laughs> and, uh, what about you, Amberly? What is the greatest gift? Because you're still, you know, you're, you're you know, on have less years behind you in this industry than the boys. So what keeps I'm, you, what does the I mean, gift the it gives you? I mean, the first thing that came to my mind is, seriously, I'm enjoying this conversation so much. I respect and admire both Eric and Ian so much. And to, I think I also just wrote, because I wanted to play with these actors and I wanted to be in a playground with them and react off them. And just most of the time, I just like to listen to them and laugh. Mm -hmm. That's really, it's very selfish. And, um, conversation, it, it's so, it's so fulfilling for me to be able to be included in the conversation that I, with them, because I, I respect them so much and they're both so funny and they have huge hearts. And to me, those two qualities, to be around that all the time and to cre create projects that will allow me to play more with people like that is really a driving force. Oh, 
And and what yeah. about for you, okay. Ian? And don't say it, Nia is the greatest gift you got from acting. Okay. Oh no, I'm not, I was <laughs> definitely not going to say that. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, you know, it's you know, there's uh, uh, it's you know, I wish it were, I could say something that's really um, altruistic Poignant. and kind of sweet and everything, <laughs> but it's it's mostly um, it's I get to to make a living doing something like Eric, the only thing that I could possibly do. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, it's just, I, I really have no skill set, um, and I'm still finding out my skill set in this industry. Um, but I, I, I couldn't do anything else. There was nothing else that I, I wanted to do that didn't seem like a tremendously terrible job. So I, I, I consider myself very lucky that I get to uh, make a living doing this. And also... You know, people come up to me every once in a while and they said, you know, you did this thing in, in this show or whatever, and it made me so happy, and, and uh, you know, I love you, my mom loves you, and all this other stuff. And that's really, I mean, that's really nice that I get to uh, have an impact on, on someone's life, even if just for a few short minutes, you know, or whatever it is. And that's, uh, that, that goes a long way when, you know, it, you haven't worked in a year and a half or whatever it is. Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel blessed that I, um, you know, nobody knows that I, you know, I'm really not as qualified as I should be for this job, <laughs> and that I've learned by doing. And that's kind of like one of the things that my acting teacher told me years ago is like, you know, you, you just got to keep doing it, and there's no, there's no way to learn it unless you're doing it. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I've had the opportunity to, you know, to learn while I've been doing this job. Well, all yeah. I know is all three of you will always be worthy of my great respect and oh, thank you. for the joy and the entertainment that you bring. I mean, I have, you know, I've watched Ian for so long on the big and small screens. And Eric, I've watched you and Amberly. Now I, I finally get to start seeing you and... I hope I will see more from you, and I hope I see more of Ian on Celebrity Name Game. I, yes, you will. I just, uh, just did another uh, three of them uh, recently. Oh, so, yes, thank, you thank God. That, that is the highlight <laughs> of my life. I mean, when I, I interviewed Courtney for uh, the film that she directed, and it was, it was the time frame was just past when Celebrity Name Game aired, and I thanked her. I said, oh, thank God, because I could stay home and watch Celebrity Name Game before I had to come interview you. <laughs> And she she was quite thrilled that somebody watched the show. <laughs> Guys, I can't thank you enough. I know everybody can see Always Worthy. It's on VOD now, and I checked. Time Warner does have it. Um, it's streaming. It's all over the place, so everybody can see you. Yes, and Yay! they should. It's a, it's it's a, it's a great film, and uh, I'm I'm very very proud of it. And. Uh, Whenever you know there's any sort of request uh, from Amberly or from Mitch, the, uh, one of the producers, you know, to do this, I'm like with with pleasure. I, I just want to give back a little bit of something that I I took from from this experience. And so anything I can do to help, um, uh, I'm in. Uh, okay, and now that that's recorded, Amberly. So if you ever need to remind yes. him of it, uh, you know. Wait, wait. Is recorded? It's live. It's That's being recorded. Man. <laughs> you know, I thought this was a rehearsal. Uh, you know, oh, it's, man. It's, oh, it's, we're doomed. It's that technology thing, you know? Damn it. Oh, right. I'm so sorry. I'll stick to it. Guys, I can't thank you all enough for joining me today. This has been an absolute joy, and I hope all of you will come back on the show again. Oh, anytime. Oh. Yeah, Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. And oh, and now we have to say goodbye because time is up. Um, again, always worthy. It's available on VOD, Time Warner, Comcast, all of those, and it's streaming everywhere. So until next week, next week we're going to have a full house here with the whole cast and director of the indie feature opening at Newport Beach, Call of the Void. Until then, behind the lens, I'm Debbie Lynn Lies. Thank <laughs> you.